Hello and welcome back to Multidimensional Integration, the video series where we talk about integrals in Rn. And in order to do that, we first have to define the corresponding Lebesgue measures, and in today's part 2, we will exactly do that. So we will explain what the n-dimensional Lebesgue measure is and what the n-dimensional Lebesgue integral is. However, before we start with the definitions, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, as a supporter you can use the link in the description to download additional material. Ok, and with that I would say, let's immediately start discussing what we already know in one dimension. So for this, let's consider the real number line R. And there we can take a whole collection of subsets which we call Lebesgue measurable. And the set of these subsets we denote with a curved L. Moreover, we also already know that this is a so-called sigma algebra. So what we get is the sigma algebra of Lebesgue measurable sets. And the most important result is that each such Lebesgue measurable set has a well-defined Lebesgue measure. So if this is the set A, the Lebesgue measure is denoted by lambda of A. And this is always a number between 0 and infinity, where infinity as a symbol is also allowed. In other words, the Lebesgue measure generalizes the concept of measuring lengths in one dimension. Therefore, the next step for us would be to go to the two-dimensional case, where we can generalize the concept of measuring areas. And this is not so complicated, because R2 is just the Cartesian product of the real number line with itself. So what we actually have to do here is simply the construction of the product measure. This is a general procedure in measure theory, but here I want to explain how it works. So I will give you all the ideas and then you can check the details in the measure theory course if you want. Ok, so this here is R2. And now we can simply take a subset on the real number line here. And on the other hand, we can also take a subset on the other real number line. And then let's call the first one a1 and the second one a2. And now what we can simply do is to form the Cartesian product of a1 with a2. And then we get a nice subset in R2. And indeed, in the case that a1 and a2 are intervals in R, this one defines a nice rectangle in R2. And obviously for rectangles we already know how to calculate the area. In fact, we would just multiply the two lengths of the intervals. So lambda of a1 times lambda of a2. And there we can already see the generalization, because this formula here for the area should hold no matter which Lebesgue measurable subsets A1 and A2 we choose. And this is already the whole starting point for the product measure, just lift everything to Cartesian products. So we take all these generalized rectangles and we want to define a measure on R2. And then the whole procedure works exactly like in part 1, we already have a formula and then we extend it to a maximal sigma algebra. Therefore, I just tell you the results we get after all these steps again. So first what we get is the so-called product sigma algebra. This one contains all the subsets of R2 where we can measure the area of. So indeed, we have much more sets in this than just the rectangles here. However, it also turns out that we have to add some more subsets in order to get a complete measure in the end. This means, technically, we also have to extend this product sigma algebra as well. And now the common name we choose for this sigma algebra is just curved L of R2. So in fact, these are the so-called Lebesgue measurable subsets of R2. And as before, this is a really large sigma algebra and it's the domain for our Lebesgue measure. And by construction, the two-dimensional Lebesgue measure comes out as the so-called product measure. So indeed, the product measure is a very general procedure we now apply for the Lebesgue measure here. 
And what we get, we can simply call lambda2 because it's the two-dimensional Lebesgue measure. Hence, each Lebesgue measurable subset here gets a well-defined area between zero and infinity. And now you already know, this one we also simply call the Lebesgue measure on R2. And we already know one important property, namely we know what it does for rectangles. So this means if we put in a1 times a2, we get out the product of the one-dimensional Lebesgue measures. Hence, for such generalized rectangles, the calculation of the area is really simple. And again, I should point out that most subsets in R2 are not of this form. But the result is that the two-dimensional back measure still gives an area for these subsets. And moreover, all the nice properties we discussed for the one-dimensional Lebesgue measure still hold for this area function in R2. So we can just quickly recall them. First, we have the two properties for a general measure. So the empty set has area zero and we have the sigma additivity. Then we also get that the sigma algebra we have here contains all the Borel sets. This means all open sets, all closed sets you can imagine are included in our sigma algebra. In fact, the sigma algebra of the Lebesgue measurable sets is so large that we also have this fact which we call completeness. It tells us that subsets of sets with area zero are already included in the sigma algebra. Okay, and now the next property cares about the normalization of the measure. So in other words, what is the area here for the unit square? Indeed, there we can use our product formula from above and we get out 1. In other words, the unit square has area 1 when we measure it with our two-dimensional Lebesgue measure. And now finally, we also have that the area does not change if we shift it in the plane. So for example, if we have this figure here and we shift it by a vector x, then the area is the same. So this is what we mean when we say that the Lebesgue measure is translation invariant. So indeed, the Lebesgue measure generalizes the concept of measuring areas in the plane R2. And now with respect to this measure, we can now also define integrals. This works very nicely because we can define the back integrals for any measure. Hence, we don't do anything new, we just put in the two dimensional Lebesgue measure for the Lebesgue integral. And therefore, we simply call this integral the two dimensional Lebesgue integral. And as you might already know, there are a lot of other notations one can use to write this integral. For example, often we need a variable name and then we write f of x and the lambda 2 of x. And please note, here x stands for a point in R2. Therefore, sometimes it's also useful to denote the two components separately. This does not change anything, it still denotes the same integral. And since it's our standard Lebesgue integral, we often omit the mentioning of lambda altogether. Then we simply write d of x1, x2. But of course, if you don't want to use two variable names, you can also simply write dx. However, then it looks exactly like our one-dimensional Lebesgue integral, so it could lead to some confusion. Therefore, if you want to avoid that, you can also just put the dimension here to the d. But of course, in the end, everything should be clear if you know the function f and the subset a. Okay, there we have it. This is how we get our two-dimensional Lebesgue integral just by performing a product measure. And obviously, we can do this construction again and again to get the higher dimensional Lebesgue measures. So for example, now we could do the same reasoning in R3. Hence, now we actually have volumes in the space. This means now we can take a set in R2 and a subset in R. And then we simply perform the Cartesian product again. In other words, what we get is this volume in R3. So maybe let's make it simple. Let's say we have a set U in R2 here and a set A3 in R. Then the volume here in R3 would be lambda 2 of U times lambda of A3. 
So there we have it. We see that the starting point is exactly the same as before. So we can do the same product measure construction we know from measure theory to get lambda 3. So the three-dimensional Lebesgue measure is also a product measure. And now you will believe me that we can do this whole procedure as often as we want and then we get the general n-dimensional Lebesgue measure. And this is exactly the result we want to have in this video. Hence, now we know what the n-dimensional Lebesgue measure on Rn is and what the properties are. So first, the common notation we would choose would be lambda with n. And then the sigma algebra of the Lebesgue measurable subsets we would denote by curved L of Rn. So this is not surprising at all and also we have exactly the same properties as before. This means we have a well-defined measure, the sigma algebra is larger than the Boel sigma algebra and our whole measure is complete in this sense. And moreover, if we form the unit cube in Rn, so we have n times the Cartesian product here, then we get out 1 as well. And also in addition we are still translation invariant for the n-dimensional Lebesgue measure. And at this point I can mention again, this whole description with measures is so helpful because we immediately get the n-dimensional Lebesgue integral as well. So we don't have to do any new definitions, we immediately get it by measure theory. And at this point you already know, usually we will not mention lambda, we will just write dx. However, in the case that the dimension is not clear from the context, we will put it here to the d. Hence, this whole thing here is really nice, because now we can write down integrals in n dimensions. The only problem with that might be that we still don't know how to do explicit calculations with these integrals. At the moment, it's only possible to calculate such n dimension integrals if the function f and the set a are nice enough for us. If it gets too complicated, we definitely need some more tools for the calculation of integrals. And there I can already tell you, this is what we will do in the next videos. So I really hope we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye bye.